Welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. In this episode, I talked to Dr. Michael Megan, a pain and regenerative medicine specialist who has developed a pain disruptor platform and who has also authored a book called A New You, Using the Body's Regenerative and Restorative Powers to Optimize Orthopedic, Hormonal, and Sexual Health Function. Dr. Megan is located in Nashville, Tennessee, and he operates through his office and through the website Live Limitless MD. Dot com. It's a broad ranging conversation, uh, very similar to the title of his book. We cover a lot of ground. We get into peptides about halfway through the interview. Um, Dr. Megan's a great guy. He covers the whole gamut from epigenetics to, as I said, peptides, hormone balance, pain management, you name it. And he's even got special interest in supporting professionals in the health field, all aspects of it as a response to some of the challenge that he himself experienced in his practice as a medical practitioner. So it's a great episode, uh, lots of good information in here. Dr. Megan's a real gem of a guy. So enjoy the episode. Remember that if you get value out of this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes or on any platform that you're listening to it on. And you can also share it with your friends and your family, anybody who you think kind of needs to hear this message. Message. Beyond that, I'm going to get out of your way so you can listen to the episode. But if you did want to get in touch with me or if you had any comments or questions at all, you can find me on Facebook or on MeWe in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Groups, or you can reach out to me on my website at natnidham.com. Thanks so much for joining me and enjoy the episode. Okay. Hi, and welcome back to Biohacking Superhuman Performance. Welcome, Dr. Michael Megan, to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Natalie. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So a little bit about Dr. Megan before we jump in, because we've got a great, great amount of uh, material to go through today. Uh, Dr. Megan is a musculoskeletal expert and a health optimization specialist focused on transformation of his clients, right? Got that right, right? Um, He's also board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation and pain medicine. And sounds like you've been in practice for a good 20 years at this point. Yep. Uh, Started uh, out of my fellowship in 2000. So 20 20 years right now, going on 21. Yes, ma'am. Wow. That's amazing. And also, he is the author of the number one best-selling Amazon book called A New You, Using the body's regenerative and restorative powers to optimize orthopedic, hormonal, and sexual health function. Man, that is a title, but it sounds amazing. <laughs> Definitely something I'm going to have to get my hands on pretty soon. <laughs> Super. And uh, and you're working on a new one, right? Which right. So not- yes, a uh, collaborative <laughs> book with uh, some of my colleagues called the Codes of Longevity, and we all kind of put in a chapter. And kind of our area of expertise, mine was on pain and regenerative medicine. And there's things from sleep to mind body to peptides to exercise, you name it. So there is going to be information for everybody involved and putting it all together kind of to manage folks because we're all different. We all have our positives and or our strengths, but also our negatives. And kind of balancing those two pieces, I think, is the the joy of doing this and also the bit of the challenge of doing this too. So, so that'll be out, uh, next month and uh, really looking forward to uh, getting feedback and uh, really helping people as well. Phenomenal. Why don't we talk a little bit about our first topic today? Let's talk a bit about musculoskeletal pain, you know, how your approach to treatment has evolved over time and I guess also why, what, what made you, change that approach? So, you know, coming out of fellowship and coming out of training and that sort of thing, you think you can fix everything and everything you're going to do is going to work and you're going to fix the world and, um, you know, you're going to be God's gift to everything. 
Well, as you go on, you start implementing some of the things you were doing. And, you know, I had great training, great interventions, you know, primarily was using fluoroscopic guided procedures for pain from anywhere from spine to joints to soft tissues and those sort of things. And then kind of morphed into using ultrasound, some other things. I was treating probably 20 or 30 patients a day. Unfortunately, only about 10% of those were getting better going the direction that I had hoped. And, you know, I was very myopic at that point. What I mean by that is when they would come in, there was a knee problem or a back problem. You know, you're all focused on that specific area. Maybe you look a little bit above or a little bit below. If you got a back, maybe you're looking at the hip, maybe you're looking at the thoracic spine. But you're really just focused on that one specific area. And you think, well, there's only one potential pain generator issue that may be going on with the client or with the patient. And again, small subset, yes, you're going to hit that and they're going to do great and they're going to be very happy with your work. And, you know, some of the things you're going to do are going to help somewhat. I just wasn't seeing that big bang where people were really getting that good push forward. So as I started moving forward and learning and going to some different courses, that's how I got into uh, regenerative medicine. And okay. I started was with an intervention called prolotherapy, which basically uses dextrose. Or mantle, but primarily dextrose, which is the sugar that's in almost all IV fluids. So if you hear the D5W or D5 half normal, the D is the dextrose. So well tolerated by everybody. And in different concentrations can be good for things like nerve or muscle pain. Yeah. Uh, can be good for uh, tendon or soft tissue pain, but also can be useful for joints. And that's kind of how most regenerative type interventions started. And then the next step up from that was PRP or platelet-rich plasma, where we take out your blood, spin it down to the platelet level, and then we can inject it in pretty much any tissue. Similar to the title of my book, you can put it in areas around your hair for hair growth. You can put it in your face or rejuvenating the face. You can put it into you know, sex organs, either the penis or the, the vagina. You can put in joints, soft tissues. And yes, it kind of sounds a little bit like snake oil, but there is pretty darn good data on all of these type of interventions and how they're done and then kind of the Cadillac are looking at stem cells or yeah. mesenchymal cells, either from bone marrow or fat, or there are even some cooler things where you may be able to get it out of blood as we move forward. And same thing, kind of injecting those into certain tissues and really trying to heal the body and using what I say is yourself to heal yourself. Mm -hmm. like having any side effect issues and problems with that are almost zero. And, you know, I, I do see that being the current treatment, but also I think this is going to continue to expand as we move forward. So that's how I got into that. And then also looking at, you know, overall body health. So when I started doing regenerative medicine, so nice step up, I was seeing good responses, but I was still seeing some of those folks were kind of lagging. They weren't kind of taken off as quickly as I would hope. So that's when I started looking at cell health, when I started looking at things like hormone replacement, when I started getting into peptides and some of the other things that we discuss in the Facebook group and, and some of the other issues there, and really trying to morph and change kind of the whole person, looking at them as a whole, as opposed to you got a joint or you got a soft tissue problem or any of those. Right. So once I started taking off on that, really trying to look at blood work, look at... Um, other forms of testing, um, heart rate variability, sleep, that sort of thing. Okay. Again, that, another big leap in kind of going to that next step. So, and that's how I've kind of morphed my practice to the point where I kind of look at all of you as opposed to just small pieces and parts of you, which I think has really transformed my life, but also the hopefully my clients and patients as well. Well, I'm sure you're seeing a different rate of success with your clients now that you're basically taking what, you know, for lack of a better word, you're really taking a holistic view of the individual as a whole, rather than to your, to your point, looking at a body part right. in isolation, which is, you know, it's a bit, you know, and, and do you find that then I can imagine that your use or prescription of, of any kind of pain medication is probably plummeted as you've as you've evolved right. in your practice right and and that's kind of the the model right now is the disease based model is kind of looking specifically so they come in 
they may get set up for injection. And I still do injections for pain, both from a diagnostic and or a therapeutic standpoint. Now, what I inject is totally different than what it used to be, which was the high dose steroid, which has its problems associated in relation to kind of shutting down your adrenals, to making you more at risk for things like osteoporosis, and bone fracture, to really hampering the environment and the joint to the point where it becomes more, more negative and more inflammatory and that sort of thing. Yeah, because so doesn't it actually end up causing or driving more degradation in the joint over time? Absolutely. Like I remember my dad telling me he got a shot in his spine and I just kind of went, oh no. Right. <laughs> you know, it's and only it's, a question of time before it comes back sure. worse. And it's kind of the Goldilocks principle too. There, a small amount, I'm talking in, instead of using a whole 40 or 80 milligrams of a steroid, you use maybe four milligrams or oh, very wow. small very similar to the way our bodies kind of release our own cortisol. And yep. cortisol is vilified, unfortunately, too much, in my opinion. If mm-hmm. it's way too high, chronically, yes, big problems, but it's kind of the same thing. If you don't have cortisol, you will die. Yeah. And that's the same thing <laughs> the pres- president yeah. had with his Addison's disease and had to have prednisone on a daily basis uh, mm-hmm. to kind of live. So, you know, if you have an injury or you have some inflammation, just a little puff of cortisol is helpful to kind of help reduce that, kind of get you on track for healing. And, you know, it's the same kind of process and thought is using just a hint of it just to give you that anti-inflammatory effect can be of benefit, but you don't have to bombard it to the point where you're basically killing everything in its wake, which is going right. to more issues and more problems. So, um, you know, I think that that's an incredibly important piece as, as we move forward. So going back to where we were with pain, so injection, and then if that doesn't work or in addition, you're thrown on some type of pain reliever or some type of opioid, which has its own negative effects. It basically kills all of your hormones, unfortunately, and really kind of puts you in a, a catabolic state instead of a, a balanced or anabolic state. Or something. Yeah. Um, actually increases uh, nerve inflammation. Short term, it will decrease. And I'm talking days. Longer term, it increases it. And the other thing is it kind of kills your inhibitory pathways, which are the things that are important, again, to balance your nervous system. So, you know, things are able to move forward. And the other thing is it kind of kills your own endorphins, which are your own natural pain relievers and that sort of thing. So are there, you know, small instances or a small subset of population that are reasonable to use those medicines on? Yes. But unfortunately it was just like pain, opioid, pain, opioid, pain, opioid. And that's how unfortunately we've gotten into this cycle that we need to kind of extricate ourselves from. So then if, if, that didn't work, then you had surgery. If that didn't work, then you were on chronic pain meds for the rest of your life. And that's kind of how things have gone over uh, the last probably 15, 20 years, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, most of us were kind of looking at that going, hmm, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way that we can kind of manage these issues and uh, challenges without putting people into this cycle. So that's where looking at, you know, total body, you know, what can we do to decrease your chronic inflammatory or inflammatory load? You know, simple things like higher dose fish oil, Mm -hmm. um, controlling your blood sugar levels with diet, you know, occasionally maybe with a medication, um, maybe of benefit like a metformin or, or maybe, um, uh, blanket on the name, but I'll come back to it. But well, Medicaid. metformin's getting some good traction in the longevity space anyway. So at some right. level, they're the side effects, you know, some of the more positive side effects of metformin might work towards right. another goal. Or berberin was the one I was trying to think of that's yeah. a little bit more of a natural intervention that can help to control blood sugars. Fasting, you know, simple things like fasting or intermittent that's the lifestyle, fasting, yeah. Where you're bringing down that inflammatory load to some degree, you know, lower level or even kind of higher level exercise to some degree can be a benefit. Um, getting out of nature, getting a little sunlight, that sort of thing. You know, working on your relationships, cutting down on your stress, improving your sleep. I mean, all the other things that are kind of that foundational piece that I think are very important that we almost totally ignore in the pain population, which is not necessarily the way we want to go because these folks are probably going to be with us for a fairly long period of time. So I think it's important to kind of address these things early, try to set the set the tone and set the table that these are ways that we're going to address. Now, is everybody going to buy in? Unfortunately, no. But the vast majority of folks are because they've dealt with some of these things 
longer periods of time and even sometimes shorter periods of time, but they haven't really been looked at in this way and they haven't really felt like people. They just felt like kind of diagnoses. So, you know, my platform is to kind of disrupt pain or be the pain disruptor and kind of revolutionize the way that we're managing some of these issues and some of these problems where we're looking at you as a whole, as a systems-based person, as opposed to you got a knee or you've got uh, fibromyalgia or you've got, you know, CRPS or chronic regional pain syndrome or any of those sort of things as well. That's amazing. Okay, so that so you kind of alluded to something here that you co- talked about a pain pain disruption or pain disruptor. So you've developed a platform called the Pain Disruptor Platform, and this platform has basically allowed you to really revolutionize pain management and resolution. So you want to talk about that a little bit, like what's involved in a pain disruptor platform? It's a good name. So, for you it. Know, I think we touched on a little bit, but looking at those baseline pieces where you're looking, you know, there's plenty of people that come in and in, in acute pain and or subacute or even chronic pain that are in a, a sympathetic state where they're always, you see them come in they look like they got the weight of the world on their shoulders and they're all kind of like worried yeah. that somebody's going to take something from them and they just look like they're overloaded. Yeah. And you know, those are the folks that probably have high cortisol levels. Is that something reasonable to consider measuring? Absolutely. I think important. And, you know, I think looking at the healthcare model, both in Canada and in the U.S., we always kind of frown on data or data is frowned upon by insurance companies and, and other folks, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. No. You know, I'm not saying we got to go nuts and get you know every test known to man, but I, I think that data is king whether it's wearing some type of uh, wearable technology like an aura ring, whoop strap, Garmin. Yep. Mine. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, you know, I think there are certain lab pieces that are incredibly important to follow along. You know, if you're going to look at cortisol, one of the better ways is either with saliva or with urine. So things like Dutch testing, if you've heard of that, can be very yep. good. Yeah. Uh, there are others that can be of benefit. But what it does is it gives you kind of a graph throughout the day. And kind of when you look at cortisol, you want it to be high in the morning, kind yep. of helps you up, get you going, get your blood sugar raised, and then it should gradually taper as we go in the evening. It should be a lowest when we're going to bed. However, there are plenty of people that that's flipped. And those are the people that have a hard time getting out of bed or they're night owls or they have trouble going to sleep and that sort of thing. Then you have other people that it's way flat the whole day and they have trouble getting going at any point. So those are the people mm-hmm. that may drink, you know, gobs of coffee or they yeah. take tons of sugar just to try to get themselves going and that sort of thing. Obviously, it helps in a little bit certain instances, but longer term, that's not going to be a good strategy and way to manage those type issues. No. So that's no. where I think looking at, at potential cortisol evaluation. And if you come in sympathetic, I don't care what I do. I could stick needles in you all over the place. I could put you on tons of peptides, meds, you name it you're not going to get better. So we've got to kind of get you out of that state. So if we can work on that part where we're working on your sleep, okay, what can we do to reduce your stress levels? Is it something that we need to kind of extricate you from life a little bit and say, okay, 30 minutes, you need to go walk in the woods by yourself with no music, nothing, that sort of thing. That may be the way to go. Do we need to get you meditating? Do we need to get you in a yoga class? Do we need to get you doing certain things for yourself? Now, I say that, but there are other people that come in that are going to be just totally like this and they need to be kept up. There's those people that just have that flat cortisol. Sometimes we need to do some things to kind of increase their sympathetic tone and that sort of thing. What do you do for those people, actually? Because we're all very familiar. You know, I mean, I spend a lot of my time in my practice bringing people down. Um, But uh, so what do you do for the people with the low cortisol? So I think those are the areas where you're you're looking at blood work in relation to hormone status. Um, that's where I think cortisol, looking at that's helpful. Things like DHEA, which is kind of a pro-hormone that goes from cholesterol down to your other sex hormones, I think is incredibly important to look at. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, even looking at aldosterone levels. So aldosterone and cortisol, those are both hormones, are kind of intimately tied. So if they have trouble kind of getting going in the morning, one simple strategy that people can employ is just put a little salt in your water in the morning okay. yeah. that will help to raise your aldosterone levels, which will tend to raise your cortisol levels and kind of get you going. There are you know, a, a number of adaptogens that we can use and they're all right. over the place, yeah. um, but those can be of benefit. And we can talk about that maybe at a different time, but those are yeah. potential options from that standpoint. 
you know, DHA can be a benefit. I mean, and, you know, caffeine at times can be vilified, but if, if it is helpful to kind of get you going in the morning and, you know, again, looking at your genetics or epigenetics, going to see what kind of metabolism you do to caffeine, Mm -hmm. um, it still has a role. And again, it's not something you want to overdo, but it's kind of, again, the gold locks principle, we're trying to get you relatively balanced and kind of get you going. Is it a challenging issue to treat? Absolutely. Usually it's easier to kind of bring people down and kind of get yeah. them scared as opposed to kind of beef people up. For sure. But even, you know, higher level app exercise or kind of hit training or just doing explosive activities very quickly. And it doesn't have to be much, 15 to 30 seconds. Just take a, uh, a ball and slam it. I mean, you could do jumping jacks very quickly. You could do just some other things that kind of hype you up to some degree and kind of help release some of the neurotransmitters that may be beneficial. And again, that's where looking at genetics can be helpful to see what's going on in your brain. Yeah. Are you producing enough dopamine? Do you chew it up too quickly? Where are you with serotonin? Where are you with epinephrine or epinephrine? I know this may be getting a little bit deeper in the weeds to some degree, but there are a multitude of things that we can look at. And, you know, is it necessary for everybody? I don't know. Um, you know, I think baseline, my opinion at this stage, as I've kind of gone through training and looking, um, I do think a comprehensive blood panel for most, if not all my clients is important. I do think epigenetic testing, those two pieces, I think if you put those together, it's going to give you data and information on probably, I'd say 90% of issues, yeah. make it a lot more precise and make you a heck of a lot better with kind of correlating the two pieces. Whereas you're not doing kind of trial and error medicine, you're kind yeah. of doing, again, very precise treatments that are going to fit with both their genetics and or what you're seeing on labs and you know, obviously how they're feeling. I mean, that's going to be the bigger key. And well, it's it's kind of three legs of the stool, right? The epigenetic, the, the interesting thing about the blood work that I've, that I've found is that it's giving you insight into what of the genetics is expressing and what is the potential of this person, right? Correct. So yeah, your lifestyle, your environment is going to have a massive impact on how your genes express so that what you're seeing on, on the labs and what you're seeing on the genomic results are not matching, Correct. but you, you have an understanding really, you are, you gain an understanding of what is possible for this person and possibly some of the better strategies to kind of get them there. Correct. It's the way those, those two metrics, I've found certainly that it's, it's amazing. First of all, how many medical doctors are now starting to use the epigenetics, but how many still are so very resistant to it? So Correct. You know, it's a slow kind of evolution, I guess. <laughs> right. And, you know, in, in one instance, so in one instance, I understand because most docs are either employed or in large healthcare systems or any of those sort of things. And they're kind of in that rat wheel where they're seeing somebody every 10, 15, 20 minutes. Right. They're just trying to get everything done in that short period of time, try to get the documentation completed and then be ready to breathe and move on to the next person. So. Part of me understands that piece where that just is not supported, but part of me is like, well, you and I and some of the other folks that we know have said, hmm, this isn't the best way to do this. Something's missing. We're not hitting the vast majority of folks. Are we getting healthier with the approach we're using right now? The answer was no. Mm -hmm. Still is no. So we're, we decided to educate ourselves a little bit more, look at some potential options that kind of fit with how we think, but also what works. And then we've incorporated that into what we do. So I get both models, but I do think that the groundswell and things from our side is helping, but also I think it's really going to come from the patient side or the client side. Yeah, This is going to be a driver to get us where we need to get. And it's, it's coming. And, you know, I think that where healthcare is going, hopefully is for the positive. And it's not just these treatments are for the elite or for people that have money. And I want to kind of spread it to everybody. Does that mean everybody yeah. gets the same yeah. gadget and toy? No, it does not mean that at all. But everybody can do the baseline stuff because the vast majority of it costs you almost nothing. Absolutely. You, you know, Absolutely. It and, and that sort. I mean, and if you're looking at food and you know, grass-fed beef and some of the other things, organic fruits and vegetables, are they a little more expensive? Yes. But you know, how much does a stroke cost? How much does Absolutely. a heart attack cost? Absolutely. Uh, how much does a joint replacement cost? What does that do to your overall health? I mean, if you fra fall and fracture a hip, I mean, that can be a big issue and problem too. I mean, it, you name it, those those outcomes are very costly and effective, and, or excuse me, costly and ineffective. 
yeah. and or they have some pretty significant downside effects. So I understand, you know, the impact of trying to pay for this, but by the same token, I try to tell my clients and patients, look at it as an investment as opposed to a cost. Yeah. And I also, as a nutritionist, I'll say that, you know, with a client who really doesn't have the, you do come across people who just don't have the resources for the optimal, optimized meat and fish and vegetables. But you know what? You take those people off a diet of like fast food and soda and excess sugar and nasty oils, and you put them on a whole food diet, even if it's not the grass fed organic, like the whole nine yards, they are going to get better. Absolutely. Right? No so maybe you get better, you get a better job, you make more money and you can afford the better stuff. <laughs> like there's yeah. there's always a way around it. I, I, I think that people get really discouraged sometimes with the whole, like I'm starting to find this, that they get so discouraged with the whole idea, oh, well, it's got to be grass-fed. And, and, and I mean, look, from an ethical perspective, from an environmental perspective, there's a thousand good reasons to go grass-fed. Right. But when we're talking about an individual and just trying to raise the bar on their health, it, you know, I think it's, it's important to give them that kind of latitude when they need it to say, you're still going to get better. Yeah, it's it's going to be okay. <laughs> better than eating a bag of chips or you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, even looking at some of the, the data that Dr. Fung looked at when he was, you know, doing the fasting, intermittent fasting piece, yeah. even if they ate garbage, uh, if they shrunk their feeding window, they actually were much healthier and actually lost weight and did better. Now, obviously, we don't want people to eat garbage in that short period of time. But your point's well taken is it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be absolutely what everybody else does in a perfect world. Absolutely, that would be great. But right now, let's... Let's just make you better. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's meet you where you are. Let's see where your goals are and let's see what we can do to work within your means and understand that uh, as we move and as we evolve and as we transform, hopefully you're right. Maybe you are able to get a better job or maybe you're going to free up some income because you're off of 10 meds now, or maybe yeah. um, you're able to you know, help your family to the point where they're healthier and they're able to do more things with you. And, and overall, you're, you're making impact all the way around. So yes, I, I agree with you 100% there. Great. When you're talking about data acquisition and technology in managing musculoskeletal and bone health clients, are you talking about wearable devices or are you talking about I think something it can be else? all of those. So I think wearables are incredibly helpful and powerful. I mean, yeah. you, you probably have dealt with clients that come in and say, I never sleep. Yeah. Unrealistic, but yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's why I think the wearables can come in and, and maybe they're right. Maybe they're not sleeping particularly well, or maybe they're not getting into deep sleep or REM. And that's where you start your an address. Maybe they are sleeping and something else is going on. Again, maybe their cortisol levels are off. Maybe as, as they sleep, they're not releasing their growth hormone or testosterone or some of these rebuilding type hormones that are incredibly important. Yeah. So yes, I think wearables are very important. I do think looking at DEXA scanning and body composition testing mm-hmm. is also incredibly powerful and important because it's something tangible that you can show to the client to say, okay, this is where you are ground zero. This is where we're starting. Bone health looks good or hmm, not so good. We got to do some things to help with that. Here's your lean muscle mass, and you can kind of play with that. And then your body fat composition, both peripheral, but also visceral, which is usually the worst type of fat because that can be more yeah. inflammatory. Um, that can contain some you know, crummy chemicals, phytoestrogens, estrogens, that sort of thing, which can be problematic and, and an issue. And it's it's better to look at, those every six months or however you're going to long you're going to look at them as opposed to looking at the scale mm-hmm. because there are certain times where the scale may not move but you've gained six pounds of muscle you've lost six pounds of body fat you know your bone health better those sort of things and you know you often see people that will get on the scale and nothing's moved and they get discouraged yet they're healthier their clothes are fitting better they feel better those sort of things. So I think it's a, a very good and tangible piece and they're not horribly expensive to be honest with you. Well, uh, and the other thing is on the flip side of it, you get people who come in and say, well, I don't have a weight problem and they don't like to look at them. They don't look like they really have a weight problem. And yet their lean mass is horrible. Like they're not carrying nearly enough muscle to really sustain. And this, now we get into the world of even talking from a longevity perspective, like you need to maintain that lean mass. You need to get rid of the fat mass that 
maybe sitting to your point around the organs and really impairing your health that way, driving infl- silent inflammation as it were. Right. And bone density is not something that you see. Correct. Like, so no, absolutely. So, you know, then- we focus often on, on the overweight, the obviously imbalanced person, but you know, I think what's really important for people to understand is even if you look like, you know, you're still spitting into the same size pants or whatever the case may be, getting an understanding of what you're made of quite right. literally is a really, um, it's a very powerful motivator and tool. Right. And go and, you know, dovetail on what you said about muscle. I mean, muscle is one of the, you know, most used places where we put our blood or our glycogen. So it goes into your liver and also goes into your muscle. So if goals are to improve uh, insulin resistance, blood sugar control, those sort of things, the more muscle you have, the better that's going to be. Right. The other piece of that is as you start to um, atrophy or as you start losing muscle mass, then you know your risk of things like fall increase, your recovery from injury increases or decreases, excuse me, and you know you you become more frail. And if you're looking at you know certain pieces of data, you know grip strength and or walking speed are two of the major measures that show how quickly you are going to die for the most part. Yeah, that's crazy. Increase morbidity, mortality. So I think maintaining muscle mass is incredibly powerful and important. And if you're looking at any type of rehab process too, strength is the bigger piece. I mean, it's not necessarily flexibility. Um, It's not necessarily, you know, any of the other things that we tend to work on. If you work on strength, that tends to help balance. That tends to help flexibility. That tends to help in maintaining the Dependence and all those sort of pieces. So um, I think I've had some issues or challenges with some physical therapists and some of those sort of things that were really kind of worried, oh my gosh, this person cannot do any resistance training. Well, that's where you've got to do the art and look at things that are going to work with them so you can slowly build them up, whether it's just an isometric contraction where you're not mm-hmm. moving the muscle but putting some pressure, whether that's using body weight exercises like you know, wall squats or wall sits or any of those sort of things. If you're using rubber bands, if you're yeah. Using- well, and strength training is is individual, right? It's like anything right. else. Like my strength training could be, you know, I don't know, doing squats with a 150 pound barbell on my back. But another person's strength training could be doing half squats, holding 20 pound dumbbells in their hands. Like I mean, it's strength training is really relative to the individual. There's no one who can't strength train. It's to your point. Right. It's just a question of where they need to start to get themselves to the next place. But that's where I think we've got to do the education, even with docs. It's like, well, don't do that. You're 60 years old. It's like, well, that's ridiculous. (laughs) You know, or don't, you know, you got back pain, don't deadlift. Well, yeah, you're not going to throw up 315 or anything like that right now. But deadlifting is one of the best exercises for kind of rehabbing, but also working on stability, strength, motion, those sort of things. So I think we give folks mixed messages and they keep hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. And pretty soon it becomes dogma, even though there's no data behind it whatsoever. So, you know, that's another kind of hack is if you can maintain your strength, muscle mass, that sort of thing, then you're going to, you're going to lick a lot of problems. And, and really well, it's almost like we almost, we condition people to age. Right. You know, we start to lay it out that, Oh, you're this age. You shouldn't be doing this anymore. Or, People go into their doctor, oh, well, it's all part of aging, as opposed to, okay, now's the time you got to put the pedal to the metal. Like the body is not going to build something it doesn't need. So if it perceives that you don't need muscle, it's not going to expend the energy to build it kind of thing. And and it's so interesting that, you know, again, like with physicians like you who are now moving into the world of saying to a 70-year-old patient you know what, Millie, you're going to have to go to the gym. We're going to have to get you on a weightlifting program. And Millie's looking at you horrified. And you're like, no, no, you can do this. And you're going to be so much better off for it. No question. And, you know, I I think one of the bigger areas in in folks probably 50 and above is they start losing glute size and glute strength. Mm -hmm. Glutes are one of your powerful, most powerful extensor muscles, but also are very important for maintaining stability when you're trying to climb stairs, get out of a chair, off the toilet, I mean, those type of things. And once that starts going, back pain increases and hip issues increase, and then you start having challenges with other joints and that sort of thing. So I agree with you 100%. And, you know, 
looking at even things like yoga, things like Pilates, things like, um, you know, body weight exercise programs and that sort of thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be heavy, heavy weights. You don't have to do CrossFit. You can. There's plenty of folks in their 60s, 70s, 80s doing CrossFit and doing great. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be that. It just has to kind of fit with what you're looking at. And, you know, again, going back to our epigenetic evaluation, there are, you know, genes and SNPs that kind of point us toward what type of exercise may be best for you. Does that mean you don't do the others? No. There are some folks that do great with strength training and are not great for endurance, but that doesn't mean that they can't run or they can't do some high intensity intervals or some other things and vice versa. There are some people that are more prone to doing well with endurance activities that maybe don't respond quite as much to strength training, but you still have to kind of cross pollinate and that sort of thing as well. But again, this is the kind of tailored approach that we're looking at for each individual and each person. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about some of this. We've talked about nutrition. We've talked a bit about epigenetics, but how about supplement and hormones? Like, I mean, my, you know, as I've moved along in my own education, I'm at the point now where I'm telling clients we need lab, like we need blood work, we need your epigenetics, and we need to understand your, what your hormone status is. Because if you don't of optimize course. your hormones, especially as we age, you're, you're going to have to fight a lot harder and you're not going to get the wins that you, you could get. And I, do you find on the hormone side, and I'd like to talk about the peptides a little bit as well and supplements, sure. but on the hormone side, do you find a lot of people are very resistant and feel like, oh, well, this isn't natural or hormone replacement is dangerous? Like there's this real fear I find sure. around hormone optimize. I have a client right now and and he's killing it in every other area, but he's in his mid fifties. And I'm like, you know, you could take it up to the next level here. And he's kind of like, oh, I don't know. I don't right. think so. <laughs> And again, I think that goes back to messaging that has come from physicians and or drug companies and some of the other things in the past that they kind of tried to vilify that or make it seem that they had to use some of their synthetic products, which were the main issues. Right. Yeah. Especially with the uh, uh, Women's Health Initiative and that sort of thing. And it wasn't even necessarily the estrogen that was the problem, the Premarin. It was the Provera, which was the uh, synthetic progesterone, which caused the main issues and problems. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have these conversations almost daily with folks. And one of the things I talk about is, okay, so if I'm going along with what you're saying, and I, and I try to give them literature support and at least talk about some things. Yeah. But if I go along with what you're saying, then I should open a clinic basically blocking hormones in 20 to 50 year olds, and they're going to do better. And they look at me like, why would you do that? Well, it's kind of the same thing. As you start losing your hormones, basically that is one of the bigger triggers for aging, for becoming less active, less mobile. Your recovery becomes poor. Your joints become more problematic and those sort of things. So, yeah, I mean, I, there's plenty of folks that come in that ask for it. I'm really looking forward to that and done some research and some evaluation and saying, yeah, we really need to do that. And typically, the sooner you start, the better you do. But yes, it is a big educational piece and that sort of thing. So if we're looking at hormone, hormone replacement, um, you know, I definitely think it's a big integral part from a musculoskeletal standpoint. So I'll start at the top. So it's outstanding for brain health and yeah. it helps with balance and those sort of things. So just a couple of caveats. You know, if you're looking at testosterone, higher testosterone levels, both in men and women, significantly reduce risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, same with estrogen to some degree. To some degree, same with thyroid as well. Sure. Um, depression, um, typically related to those three again. Sometimes progesterone levels being low, all, all of the above, as opposed to putting you on antidepressant. If I can optimize your hormones, then I can make a significant impact into um, your health issues. There was a recent, I wasn't that recent, but there was a study called the STAR study yeah. that basically looked at comparing um, antidepressants to uh, T3 hormone, which is the active form of the thyroid hormone. Yeah. The folks that were on the T3 did better than people on antidepressants and had a lot less side effects and those sort of things. So amazing. You know, that's a part of it. Um, it's great for cardiovascular health, kind of reduces risk of things like heart attack, stroke, that sort. Um, your joints, your soft tissues have tons of receptors, um, both uh, primarily, I would say the two that are, are most prevalent would be testosterone and progesterone. So if women are a little bit concerned with that, I mean, progesterone is very anti-cancer. So especially for breast, 
It's very good for your brain, very good for your skin, but also for your joints and is another one that helps to build bone. Testosterone kind of the same way. Uh, if you're looking to build bone, testosterone is outstanding. It gets you know metabolized into estrogen, which can be very helpful from that standpoint too. We're going to dovetail a little bit onto the peptides. The growth hormone analogs are really good yeah. for helping to build bone and that sort of thing. Um, really good for recovery as well. So as we age, unfortunately, our recovery tends to be longer and longer and longer. If we're optimized hormone related, then our recovery tends to improve pretty dramatically, pretty significantly. We can either maintain muscle mass or grow some of the things we touched on before. Um, it really is a, and it's described, and I didn't make this up, but uh, kind of a symphony of activities yeah. and that sort of thing. And if some of that is removed, then you're going to have problems moving forward. And, you know, I've, I've done some nursing homework and some other things. So typically what I'll tell some of my clients is, you know, most of the folks in, in nursing homes have significant reductions in their hormone status and a lot of other things go on too. But that's why they have some challenges with doing a good number of their activities. So I think it's important to look at that. And if somebody is just totally resistant to it, even with the information you provide, then, yeah, we'll work around it. And we'll try to do the best yeah. we can without. But I do think that has to be a big piece. One um, source I will provide to your folks, if they haven't read the book, uh, The End of Alzheimer's by Dr. Dale Bredesen, they probably need to do that. Great the, book. Yeah. His work and his book and that sort of thing is similar to what we've talked about. There's not a magic bullet. There's not a magic pill. There's not a magic injection. And there's not a magic anything that's going to fix all of the ills of the world. And he kind of goes in the beginning of the book talking about how Alzheimer's was trying to be treated that way. One pill or one you know, intervention was going to be the big key. Well, he comes up with everything from diet to hormones to supplementation to exercise to you name it, he's got multiple things that are necessary to try to optimize to both halt the progression of Alzheimer's, but also kind of turn it around, which is sure. pretty fascinating if you think about it. And, you know, I, I'm had my genetics run recently, so I'm a, a APO34, which means I got a 30% increased risk of Alzheimer's and or dementia. So looking at things like reducing my saturated fat and some other things from that standpoint, really trying to optimize I've been on hormones since 2014 and have been you know, vocal about that on social media and other places too. And you know, I, I think looking at the entire piece and really trying to help to optimize is incredibly powerful and important. The piece that, again, I usually have to talk with my patients about and or my clients is once you start down this road, this isn't something you do for a few weeks or a few months or even a few years. No. So if you go down this road, this is something you typically got to stay on. Otherwise, if you stop, you're falling you off that cliff. <laughs> so I think that's another one. Everybody looks at you kind of, I don't say everybody, but some people look at you like, huh? And, you know, and I understand that piece. Most people don't want to take this, that, or the other thing, or they want to limit what they're taking. And then you have other people who are, you know, want to take everything under the sun. And mm -hmm. maybe that's not the best approach either. But, you know, I think there is going to be a, a delicate balance of that. And going back to Dr. Bredesen's book, he talks about 30 to 36, either supplements, hormones, or that sort of thing that most people should be on. And, you know, there may be even a smaller subset that uh, you, you could use maybe six to 10 type interventions. I mean, simple things like vitamin D. I mean, vitamin D typically works as a hormone in, under the vitamin realm, but it actually works more like a hormone. And it's yep. got some incredibly powerful, you know, ways to manage and treat brain health issues, musculoskeletal issues, nerve-related issues, gut, detoxification, you name it. Uh, magnesium is another kind of magic one that I think everybody really is deficient in and really needs to be optimized on. And again, probably involved in two, three, 400 reactions in our body, or there's probably more that we don't even know about yet. But again, looking at those supplements, those nutrition levels, that sort of thing, definitely, I think there's some commonality in all of what we do, whether it be from a musculoskeletal standpoint, whether it be from a bone health standpoint, whether it be from a brain health standpoint. The nice part is these things are what are called pleiotropic, meaning they have multiple effects. So they're not just focused in one silo. They have effects for your brain. They have effects for your skin. They have effect for your cardiovascular system, your musculoskeletal system, sexual function, you name it. So, it works. Yeah. yeah. So it's starting exactly. from the ground. Really, it's starting from the ground up, which I think, you know, is 
is hopefully will become the universal metric, the universal template, if you will. You know, the nutrition, the sleep, the stress, the hormones, the all these things. So, do we want to touch on peptides? Do we want to talk about this precision medicine health optimization model? How it takes you from ground here, ground zero to superhero? Maybe we can talk about all of those in a little package because sure. I do want to get to the part where it sounds like you had you had a real kind of aha moment in your own life and practice as a physician that kind of maybe also helped to move you in this direction. So. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I I think again, until you got the baseline stuff together, doing peptides and some of the other biohacking tools, like, you know, uh, pulsed electrical magnetic field therapy, like, you know, juve lights or red light treatments, that sort of thing can be helpful. But, you know, I do think peptides are incredibly interesting. And again, I applaud you and some of the other folks that are putting this information out and are creating conversation and and information that I think is very helpful and very powerful. Uh, But, you know, the beauty of peptides is, you know, they're almost all natural compounds. They're all something or parts of something that have been in your body. And, it seems like one comes out every week or every other week. And that's good, yeah. <laughs> which is interesting. Um, but by the same token, it's hard to keep up on all of them too, especially <laughs> from a use standpoint, that sort of thing. So that's where our education will continue to evolve and improve. But the reason I like the peptides is there's really limited side effects with them. Now, can you have those? Absolutely. With anything. I mean, some people don't tolerate Tylenol well. Some people don't tolerate you know, antihistamines well, and there may be reasons for that. But I would say the vast majority of folks are not going to have major issues or problems with peptides. And again, going back to what we talked about with hormones, they are very pleiotropic. So some of the common ones that we typically talk about on your forum, BPC-157, either from an injectable oral standpoint, seems like, again, snake oil, but it can help folks with brain health issues, with concussion issues, it's great for healing of the skin. It's really good for musculoskeletal pain, either putting it subcutaneously, orally, or putting it where you want to put it. Um, and, you know, can be a benefit that way. can be helpful for blood sugar control, insulin resistance, bone health, you name it. Yeah. So, yes, I, you know, I think that it's, it's kind of another revolution of what's going on with medicine where we're getting away from... Uh, commercialized and or just silo focused medications where we're just trying to treat one issue. And maybe if we treat that issue, we're kind of diminishing something else where these are kind of helping to enhance our overall body. And, you know, the beauty of them, some of them you can stay on forever. Some of them you can kind of cycle. Some of them you use once or twice a year. Um, it's, it's really kind of fascinating and interesting as far as that goes. So, you know, a couple of ones that can be very helpful for stimulating stem cells, both your own endogenous or it can be helpful for stem cell procedures. You know, things like BPC is one, TB4 or TB500, that's another one. Uh, thymosin alpha one can be another one. And then one I'm using actually right now is GHKCU injectable. Is that Actually's not the best? <laughs> and to be helpful for, again, skin hair, skin, or I said skin already, um, body composition, but also has been shown to stimulate stem cells production in you, which is good. And um, again, we're, we're constantly turning over. We're not just one static being. I mean, most people think of bone that it doesn't move. Well, we kind of turn our bone over probably every 18 to 36 months, believe it or not. So mm-hmm. things are always in cycles and changes and that sort of thing. And you know, as I've gotten into this, it, it, some things have become clearer than other things have become a little, little bit more fuzzy. Um, something that you may be optimized on today, go down six, 12 months, it may be a little bit off. And it's, it's always going to be kind of a fluid situation or kind of a moving target to some degree. But that's the that's the fun of it too. Um, but also can be the challenging part of it as well. So, um, you know, all those sort of things kind of throwing them in together has really given me a pretty substantial toolbox to help people from a musculoskeletal standpoint, but from a health optimization standpoint and kind of getting people moving forward. And, you know, some peptides are very cheap. I mean, they're, they're easy to use and, you know, the vast majority of them are injectable. So that sometimes gives people a little bit of a squeamish feel, but they're easy to put in. They don't tend to be that painful or that uncomfortable for the most part. 
And um, you know, again, I think that this has kind of revolutionized and will continue to revolutionize medical care and and, yeah. and health overall. Now, are there some forces potentially, big pharma, government, that sort of thing that may not want to see that happen? Yeah, but that's where I think at this stage that we've got to educate the the public and or the people that we're treating because if the vast majority of folks want it, it's going to be very challenging for them to take it away. So, and the same thing with hormones and some other things too. So if, if people are asking for you to sign a petition or kind of write your congressman or those sort of things, we're doing it for a reason because we want it to have it available for all of us and not just be in you know little areas where big pharma or big food or big healthcare and that sort of thing or big government tells us exactly what we can and can't do, which unfortunately you know, could happen. So I think yeah. that's, that's a yeah, powerful that's a piece. Yeah, there's definitely eye. forces at play. So that public policy piece. So. And then going, you know, as I was in my career, probably five, six, seven years ago. So, yeah, I mean, it, it felt like I was on that rat wheel constantly seeing, you know, 30 people a day, limited folks getting better. Um, a lot of things going on in, in life, you know, you get in that point yourself where your hormones are a bit off, your body composition is changing, you're not sleeping particularly well, maybe your diet's not particularly good, your relationships are maybe not where you'd like them to be, and then what happens, you tend to isolate yourself more, which is probably the worst possible thing that you can do instead of trying to reach out and, and collaborate, and, you know, I definitely got in a point where I was totally burned out and was not in a good place from a mental health standpoint or from a physical standpoint as well. And it was not a good feeling. Um, you know, it forced me to kind of drag myself to work as opposed to going there with a good focus, um, passion, energy, that sort of thing. And it's not good for patient care. It's not good for you know any of the other pieces associated with that. If you're not healthy, then you're not going to make anybody else healthy and that sort of thing. And as I've gone on, I've tried to kind of turn those. And that's where looking at the precision health has actually helped myself and getting some treatment from some of my colleagues. And also, you know, I've been to a few meetings. You brought up the book. The book I, I started as a project um, with a guy named Mike Koenigs, where he did publish and profit, which is where we met. There was 100 different people that came for that course. And they were from all walks of life, some medical, but some entrepreneurial, some in industries all over the place. And, you know, the, the book writing part was fun. It was, you know, uh, kind of helpful all the way around uh, in that sort. But the bigger piece that I found was the collaboration, was mm-hmm. finding people that had similar challenges, concerns, issues. They were looking for something different. They were maybe looking to morph careers until they get out of what they were doing. They were just not happy. And it kind of opened my eyes to say, hmm, you're not alone. It's okay. There's hope. There's support. There's all these sort of things. So the thing I'm doing now is I'm coming up with a course and or potential live interaction and or both to kind of give back and really keep physicians from getting in that position. I don't know if people know, but about one to two doctors per year, or somebody said again, per day. One to two doctors per day commit suicide, wow. both in the U.S. Wow. And, and worldwide. So it's it's a big issue, big health issue. We have docs that are retiring prematurely just because they can't handle it. Some are getting out of medicine totally to look for other careers, which you know I, I applaud them for. But it also leaves a void because mm-hmm. they've got people that they're caring for and that sort of thing too. And then I'm also working with folks that are uh, first responders, so you know, police, fire, rescue. Um, folks that are you know working from an entrepreneurial standpoint, where entrepreneurs have significant challenges in that, and even from the military standpoint, and military suicide is through the roof. Where about twenty to twenty-two exabets are killing themselves each year. So, goal is to try to give back and really try to save people. To be honest with you, I'm not trying to you know, mince words at this stage. Is I want people to understand that they're loved. There's hope. There's a community for you. And I want to really dive deeper into the things that we do where we're not just looking at 
you know, mind body or yoga or meditation. I think all of that has a role. Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying that even a little bit. Yeah. It's just, it's not always enough for someone who's in crisis. I mean, it's right. So looking at blood work or let's see where you are from a hormone standpoint, maybe there's a reason that you feel depressed and angry and upset and that sort of thing. Or maybe, you know, we change your diet a little bit, or maybe we change your focus a little bit, or maybe we find you a little bit of a a side job that really lights you up that allows you to do that. Or maybe you do and and totally change what you're doing or kind of change your focus or any of those sort of pieces that I think are incredibly helpful and important. And I think the other thing is kind of make it a broad brush to show people, kind of show people some things that they don't know. So what you don't know, you don't know. So Mm -hmm. that's the other thing from that standpoint as well. So that's another one of my platforms that I'm really uh, passionate about and really jazzed about. And I think uh, definitely is going to be necessary, especially coming out of this pandemic and some of the other things. For sure. Well, or even as we grind through the pandemic, which is not exactly over just yet. All right. So let's finish off here. And why don't you share with us? Dr. Megan, your pearls of wisdom for life and health that people can implement today. And these days, I think it's needed more than ever. Like, how do we stay calm in the chaos? Like, what are what would be three big things you would really point people towards? Right. So I think the first one is, I think, sleep. And, you know, I, I was as guilty of it as we talked about in the past. I thought sleep was kind of you know, optional. And if I got four hours or six hours, okay, I can, I can keep yeah. pushing through. I can keep pushing through. I can keep pushing through. No, it, it doesn't. And it's hard to make it up and those sort of things. Now, does everybody need seven to nine hours? No, there are a small subset of the population. Again, look at our genetic piece. They can do that. But that's the very deck twos. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> So, but I would say the vast majority of folks need about seven to nine hours of sleep. So I think the big take home for me is come up with a sleep strategy. Um, And what I mean by that is try to do something similar each night. So first thing is try to go to bed at the same time. I don't care what that is for you. Could be nine o'clock for some, could be 10 o'clock for some, could be midnight for some. This kind of depends on how your day is going to go and how best you work and that sort of thing. So find a common sleep time to go to bed and also a common time to get up. Even on weekends, I would say try to get up at almost the exact same time. Um, Other thing I would suggest is turning off all technologies, be it cell phone, be it TV, be it computer, iPad, you name it, at least 60 minutes before bed. If you can do it 120 minutes before bed, that's even better. The other thing that can be helpful for that if you just absolutely have to do some things are getting some blue blocking glasses. And there are some that you can spend hundreds of dollars on. There are some that are great for 25 to 50 bucks. And I'm not, I've got no uh, you know, affiliation with any companies or any of those sort of things. Maybe I should get some, but um, you can get them off Amazon very easily without much of an issue or much of a problem. And, you know, I I just think simple ways from that standpoint uh, is looking at sleep, I think, is going to be incredibly powerful and important. And, you know, are there certain things that can be looked at similar to what we talked about with caffeine? If you're a slow caffeine metabolizer, maybe you have one cup of coffee in the morning and you're done. Um, If you are somebody that's got the Adora gene that, you know, keeps you awake at night, if you've got caffeine a little bit later, that's another thing to look at. Um, Some people do great with melatonin. And do very well, and it's very helpful for their sleep. If that's you looking at the data, most people try to take it right before bed. Well, that's not necessarily the best time. Typically, we want to take about three hours before we want to go to sleep. So, if you are one of those folks that is good with melatonin, then that's the time to take it. If that's not something that tends to resonate with your genetics, maybe not the best thing to do. Magnesium can be very good to take at night or in the evening. Doesn't tend to make you fall asleep, but tends to help you maintain sleep. And that's what. Yep. If you're looking at peptides, that's where, you know, some of the um, growth hormone analogs can be very good for sleep. Doesn't work for everybody. Unfortunately, no. But those are very good because most of the time our growth hormone tends to peak at night, which helps us recover and kind of get back to where we need to be, but also can be very helpful from a sleep standpoint. That's what we think. So sleep would be number one. I think the second one is really looking at diet. And we, we delved into that to some degree. Doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean got to eat perfect. That's not the point. But you've got to eat according to your genes, number one, but also to try to have a goal and a plan and kind of see where you are. And it's, there isn't one diet for one person. I hate the word term diet. I think it's more of a lifestyle. Absolutely. Uh, And some people do great with intermittent fasting and fasting. And that's the thing. And that is one thing that really helped myself. 
Other people, unfortunately, it doesn't work particularly well for. Some people do great with carnivore or keto. One of my colleagues um, in our Piron group um, actually had a Plin 1 that he has heterozygous. What that means is he tends to do better with 200 to 250 grams of carbs per day. So he, like everybody else, before he did his genetics, was doing the carnivore keto thing, was losing muscle mass, wasn't recovering well, felt terrible, all wow. that sort of thing. Yeah. Got his genetics kind of upped his carbohydrate intake, and it's not garbage carbohydrates, it's good stuff. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and that turned him around, weight loss started to happen, muscle mass improved, all those sort of things. So that's, again, just another example of looking at ways to go. Then I think the other piece is just looking for stress relief and joy. So again, I'm a big right. fan of just getting out of nature for 20, 30, 40 minutes and just decompressing. I mean, if you can meditate even for three to five minutes during the day, I think mm -hmm. that can be outstanding. Do something you enjoy. If it's reading, if it's journaling, if it's you know praying, whatever that thing is for you, carve out some time to do those sort of pieces. And then you know there are there are many other multitude of things that we can get into. So beauty of it is I've got a, a PDF that is going to be available on my website that'll be free to everybody on all your listeners. So if you go on www.livelimitlessmd.com. That will be on there and then you can download it for free and uh, uh, definitely another piece that you can use to try to help optimize your health. If you want to work more in depth, we can definitely send something up as far as a free 15 minute consult and or see if uh, we're able to work together. And I think the beauty of that too, kind of dovetailing the things we talked about before, but also with the burnout part is I think it's as important for docs, coaches, and that sort of thing to be able to choose your clients as much as your as your clients choose you. Yeah. So what I mean by that is uh, you're not going to resonate with everybody and everybody's not going to resonate with you, which is okay. There's no problem with that. There's somebody for everybody. It's kind of like marriage or dating or that sort of thing. But I think that's where some folks get in trouble is they think they have to treat or manage everybody. And if you're not on the same wavelength, that's really not going to be advantageous for either one of you. And yeah come up with some bad press or bad reviews or or you're just not going to get the response for the client that they're looking for. Now, the nice part of that with you know, the collaborative or network we have is I could potentially send you to somebody else that may be ideal for you. So that's yeah. the other piece that I think everybody needs to look at is, hey, you don't have to treat everybody or you don't have to manage everybody. You've got to have standards. And if the client doesn't meet those standards, say, listen, I don't think we're a good fit. I don't think we're a good match. You're not being difficult. You're not being rude. You're not being any of those sort of things because you don't want to waste their time as much as you don't want them to waste yours. So I think that that is another piece to look at all the way around. So. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea because definitely in the coaching world, like as a health coach, nutritionist, this is something that it took me a little while to figure out. But we both the client and the coach and now the physician, which is interesting hearing it from a physician because you don't necessarily hear of physicians selecting their client, their patient load in any way. It's it's almost like the expectation is the doors open, people are going to walk in and you're going to treat them. And I think that in the traditional model of medicine, that may be true where you're kind of trying to tr to paint everybody with the same brush. But as you move into this more personalized, precision-based medicine, where you're really trying to connect with people and getting them to make these fundamental changes in their lives, there has to be a much better connection between the physician, the coach, and the patient. And, and I think I really like what you said. It's not just for the, the, the caregiver or the health practitioner. It's as much for the client so that Absolutely. they end up with a better result and a more rewarding experience. So right. and it's, it's a really contract powerful. between both of you, no question. And you know, yeah. I think it's, it's important. And, you know, obviously with, you know, trauma, emergency care, those sort of things, I mean, you can't pick and <laughs> No. And, you know, there are some people that, you know, you have to manage either way. But if you're looking more at a, you know, precision health model or something that you have more control over, I think your intake process needs to reflect that. And, you know, if somebody comes in and says, look, I'm not going to quit smoking, I'm going to continue to eat Twinkies, and I'm not going to exercise, and I'm not going to meditate, for example. Um, yeah, maybe not the best client for you and I, I'm not saying. Mm -hmm. But there are some folks that would say, you know, that's my ideal client, because I, I have the magic or the power to kind of 
morph and change them and kind of get them going, which is awesome. So I think it just depends on what your quote unquote avatar may be or that ideal client to you. It doesn't mean everybody's going to fit that, but I think the the process is important as I, again, I think for you as much as the client is. So I think that's something to think about as folks go into business or, you know, want to do maybe a side hustle or any of those sort of things. Right. Don't take everybody. I mean, it's, Yes, I mean, you're like, ah, I need to make some money or I need to do this or I need to do that. But if somebody's not resonating with you, what are they going to do to you? They're going to bring you down. Your cortisol levels are going to go up. You're going to worry. You're not going to sleep. You're going to feel terrible. And unfortunately, Mm. then then you're burned out. Then you're not happy and and those sort of things, too. So it's a give and take as far as what you want and also what you feel like you can give the client. That's where looking at goals and looking at things in the beginning, I think, are very powerful and helpful. At some point, you just got to say no. I mean, for example, quick one, um, some of the folks that come in for regenerative medicine interventions, that sort of thing, I may say, look, I think you may be a candidate, but first of all, we've got to improve kind of your mental outlook. You seem depressed. You seem down. You seem agitated. Second, we need to get, you know, potentially 25 to 30 pounds, five, or, you know, 20 to 5 to 30 pounds off. We've got to improve your overall strength and or your ability to recover, that sort of thing. Um, we got to get your blood sugars and or your insulin resistance. I mean, a, a whole myriad of things where you're like, okay, looking at your totem pole list, I think your knee's sixth. We got to get the other five things. Exactly. <laughs> That's going to give you the best opportunity to heal and get the best response to the treatment. I mean, I don't want you to spend money on something and the vast majority of those are not covered by insurance. I don't want you to spend money on something that A, probably won't work. B, you're going to be upset with me about because it didn't give you the response or the the result that you were looking for and you know again we're going to have an adversarial type feel so most i would say the vast majority of folks buy in about 80 90 percent are like no nobody's ever talked to me about the rest of this stuff i'm glad that we dived in and yes i really want to make this a win-win for everybody but you're going to get that five to ten percent that are just like just do the procedure i'm going to go find somebody that will and you know at times you just have to say yeah I think that's probably your best approach is go find somebody that will just do the procedure and see how you do. So I just think that's got to resonate with you and kind of your passion and your focus. And I'm not going to tell anybody what that means to them. That's the practitioner and and you with the client. So just figure out what that is, I think, is the take home message as far as that goes. Great. All right. Well, lots of uh, many, many pearls of wisdom there. Thank you so much, Michael. So where people can find you, you gave the URL before, is LimitlessLifeMD.com. It's the LiveLimitlessMD.com. Oh, sorry. LiveLimitlessMD.com. I should have written you it down. It. I'll and put it in the show notes too, so people will have an easier time to find you. And uh, you're located in Nashville, right? Correct. Right. Yep. But you, but do you work virtually with clients? Well, I guess yes. for the pain stuff, you can't, but for... Well, yes and no. I mean, we can definitely do the beginnings of some things virtually. Obviously, mm-hmm. if we're going to do something interventionally, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but, uh, yes. I mean, there are opportunities and options where we can kind of set the table and get an idea if it's something that may be of benefit to you. But same token, similar to what we just talked about. Usually I'm working on some of their other pieces before we get to that orthopedic or that musculoskeletal piece. So, um, but yes, I mean, we can do pain consults and we can do musculoskeletal consults on and have done. And they've actually worked quite well, but yeah, there comes a point where you do have to put hands on somebody at some point in the future and whether they travel toward me or another state that I'm licensed in, that's definitely something that we can do. Okay. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you again so much for agreeing to be on the show today, Michael. I really, really appreciate your time and sharing you sharing your stories and all this wealth of information. So once again, uh, Dr. Michael Megan has a book out already called A New You, Using the Body's Regenerative and Restorative Powers to Optimize Orthopedic, Hormonal, and Sexual Health Function, and lots of other amazing projects on the go. So keep in touch with him through his website and um, can't wait to see what's coming out. And maybe when the next book comes out, we'll talk again. That sounds great. Well, I appreciate it, Natalie. Have a great day, great weekend, and look forward to talking more. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be heard 
and to be seen. If you'd like to connect with me directly, or if you'd like to leave any comments, or if you have any questions about this episode, please reach out to me directly through my website, natnidham.com. And of course, if you're not already a member of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Community on Facebook, that's where you'll find me every day. It's a short application. Just answer a couple of questions and you're in and interfacing with other amazing biohackers. Thanks again. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.